This could be very depressing. I'm going to try and make it not depressing. Uh, I give myself titles for conference talks to force me to do some work that I haven't done uh, before the deadline appears. And I wanted to know how the cost of living crisis was being mapped. Uh, but let's just go back. Uh, because it helps to go back, I think, to remember how things were different in the past. Uh, 1963, when the society was begun, 13 years of conservative government were coming to an end. 13 years in which they built more council houses than any government before or since. 13 years in which the life expectancy of people in Britain improved at a rate we've never seen before. 13 years in which education buildings spread. It was a wonderful time, it was 1963. 1963, there were only six countries in the world which had better health than us, and their populations all put together were smaller than we were. Uh, we had the beginnings of baby incubators. We had the lowest infant mortality rate in the world. In 1963, the majority of children alive had at one point or other grown up in a council house. So if any of your grandparents, or for the young ones, great-grandparents go, I grew up in a council house, you'll say to them, you were normal. Nothing special. That was normal. We had the most progressive housing uh, system in the world. We had largely cleared the slums. 1963 was uh, great. Between the Lady Chatley's lover and the Beatles' first LP, something else began. Uh, my mum and dad met. And uh, then hence me. Uh, not 1963, but 1960. Eight, Ichiku Park, it's all too beautiful, for those who can, can remember. Uh, during the period just before, in the middle of the largest flu pandemic that we'd had since 1918, in the middle of 1957, the Prime Minister Macmillan could stand up and tell the population, you've never had it so good. And it was true. And the flu came and the flu went. The flu comes and goes uh, quickly. Uh, but also, people could remember the 30s. They could remember the last cost of living crisis. They could remember people going hungry. In the 1930s, we had an 11-year period of falling real wages. We had uh, miners going hungry. We had royal family going out and actually uh, talking to the population for the first time in the beginnings of being slightly more human. But since 2008... Our cost of living crisis, which really in a way began then, although we only called it it for the last two years. Real wages have gone down. There's only one uh, crisis which supersedes us, which is the 1798 to 1822 Napoleon one in terms of cost of living. The cost of living crisis words, it's the last two years, it's inflation, but it's inflation built on the situation we were in before. That mapping. The mapping is kind of, is kind of like crisis. It's fairly abysmal. Um, although the topic matters so that it doesn't matter. This is 38 Degrees. It's a charity and organisation. They just stick pins, but each pin has a story. If you have good eyesight, you can read the story. I think this one is from Oxford. Um, and it's rather like, and of course, it's far, far more serious. But the only thing I've seen quite like this is the Atlas of the Holocaust, which had quite crude maps, but then individual stories of families that, that brought it home. Go forward to one other. If it will go forward, what is the trick? Maybe it's this. Doesn't look like it. I am getting to that age. <laughs> no, all up. Always, and none of them are moving. Mm. Well, shall I try this? Yeah, try that. It's going to be a long talk looking at the story of Susan from Oxford West Abingdon, 67 year old grandmother whose rent's gone up by 100 pounds. Okay. <laughs> so maybe She's going to be the opposite way than you think. Oh. Okay, okay, okay. And another one, this is Cambridge, less dots. Not, not particularly. Uh, affected. <laughs> more and more crises. <laughs> oh. uh, um, this is on this, I'm not cherry picking these. 
Uh, you'd expect the Daily Mirror to do the map. Honestly, might win worst map ever. Um, a series of shades of green that uh, you can't compare to each other. And um, the here's I've clicked on Cambridge, that's why you know the actual story is tragic. This is nine thousand seven hundred people being given the three hundred and one emergency payment since within the last twelve months. People on disability getting an extra seven thousand in Cambridge. Birmingham, which you can't see, is the darkest shaded. And that's because they didn't divide by the population. Right? So it's just the largest local authority. But the subject's so important, it doesn't really matter if the map's awful. But but it does. And now, of course, Birmingham is the largest local authority in all of Europe to have gone bust. And if it doesn't sell enough things between now and Christmas, it can't pay the wages. I can tell you this can get very depressing. I'm saving that for a talk tonight in London. You get the maps instead. Uh, but what really matters? And um, this is what I find interesting. You know, if you're worried about our cartographers or popular or newspaper or television cartography mapping the things that really matter, uh, then you have to have a little, little look at what really matters. We, of course, survey people. Uh, the answers we get depend largely on how we ask questions, but I like Ipsos Mori. I don't like YouGov. Uh, Ipsos will tell you that inflation and prices is number one. The economy is number two, which is probably... Enough where people are saying inflation and prices. And in August, when they put together all the answers that involve pollution, environment, and climate change, they eventually managed one month to get climate change into number three. Uh, but one of the things I'm, I'm to tell you, and I'm in the kind of right building for it, is that although people like many of us may think climate change is the most important, the very large majority of the world's middle class do not, and it isn't for them. And for the poor half of the world, it's just about getting food still. Um, we draw lots and lots of maps and charts. They're in the building, the foyer, the red and the blue bars and so on. Of climate change, we do almost nothing for cost of living crisis, even though it is longer than just a couple of uh, days. Um, it only gets into the top four since June 2022. Different kind of inflation. People often tell you this is just like the 70s, completely different to the 70s. In most years in the 1970s, wages went up by more than inflation. Inflation was huge. Wages went up by more. Really bad news if you happen to have wealth, because it like disappears, but very different uh, to what's going on at the moment. Uh, and things that people don't worry about. Too many graphs, so I'm going to skip over that. But worldwide... So Ipsos do this every month. Their survey includes India, which helps us get the population up. The Chinese Academy of Sciences also do a survey, at which point you can say you know what most of the world at least say they worry about. And here's the order. And it's been, it changes a little bit, but not that much. Inflation is the primary concern of people on the planet. And of course, this is people that survey companies can get to, which is what I call middle class, because you've got to be able to answer an internet question. Next, crime and violence. The possibility of war, actual wars, actually being mugged. It's the second most biggest concern. Poverty, social inequality is way up there for the world's middle class when they're asked what are the most important things. Then unemployment. Actual, real fear of unemployment. Uh, then financial and political corruption. How are your elites behaving? That features way up at the top. And then healthcare, which in China for 30 years has been number one, uh, partly because of a very aging population, partly because you do have to find some money to bribe somebody, um, and you're often doing most of the world to get healthcare. And if you haven't got the money to bribe or to pay privately, you're, you're in trouble. And then climate change. Um, and it's often a shock if I show this in Oxford. Of course, I've shown it to students who, uh, for students, climate change is there, and then it's a long way down to biodiversity, and then a long way down to why isn't everybody else vegan? I don't want to be burned. Um, it's, there's this kind of disconnect, I think, in what, what really matters. Then if you're going down, taxes, education, immigration control, Moral decline. So any of you who are really most concerned about the moral decline of society, you're not alone. Mm -hmm. um, and then threats against the environment, biodiversity, and so on. 
A big variation between countries, which I won't go through, um, of these things. But I, I am, I'm interested in what the world worries about. Uh, in terms of, here's another map. Um, the questions really matter. The question here was, is it likely you're going to be displaced from your home in the next 25 years as a result of climate change? Um, and one in three people say they think they will be. Um, now, of course, people are not very well informed. You can't necessarily know. I'm slightly biased at this because my mum and dad retired uh, next to the village of Fairbourne. You may not know Fairbourne. Uh, the titles for Fairbourne is First Village Lost to the Sea because of sea level rise. It was abandoned by the Welsh government. Fairbourne is doomed. They have quietly decided it's not doomed. It's just a spit. The spit goes up and down. Sea level rise of 20 centimetres by the It's not going to kill Fairbourne. But you could see why people would think uh, the sea is rising. It's going to all get us. Or the opposite concern for people are going to been recorded. I won't say who it is, uh, but the elderly gentleman who every time I meet him asks me, what are we going to do about the small boats, Danny? To which my reply is, you live in one of the highest villages in Yorkshire. It's going to be a long time before the sea. <laughs> anyway, um, different different concerns. I mean, it's like 35% of people are not going to have to move home because of climate change. If, that, if they did, moving home would not be their biggest priority. Right? Things there'll be other things far worse than that. Uh, that's the map of the British Empire. It's just my obsession with the fact we draw maps to make India look really small, and it isn't. What matters in surveys like this is, is India because there's just a number of people, and there you might be more likely. Although, as yet, we don't have brilliant evidence as to how much people are. Uh, BBC News Banner. You'll almost all be familiar, I guess, with, with clicking on the BBC News website. You might have noticed over the last four years, they're beginning to run out of space for vital, really important issue that's going to be a banner item forever. Um, in fact, they've even not COVID off, haven't they? Yeah, yeah, COVID was there for ages. War in Ukraine, cost of living is there permanent, climate's permanent. Well, it's a bit unfair knocking COVID off, seeing as this thing is absolutely endemic in here with us, but anyway. And there's a constant stories. This is the cost of living stories. Slight over proportion of faces that aren't white, I would say. Maybe just um, subconscious bias. Maybe it's you know, the cost of living story. That's who we'll pick. Uh, and there are lots of really interesting stories that don't get told. This is a graph of child poverty. You may not be aware that child poverty now for many years has been lower in Scotland than in every single region of England, in the southeast of England. Right, things do change. It's not all depressing, but those stories don't get reported uh, very much. Instead, the BBC reports Scotland in grave danger of missing child poverty targets. Not Scotland better than all of England at child poverty. Uh, Back in 2008, this is my beginning of a quick moan about the state of things. The BBC did a better job in 2008 of mapping than it does now. Uh, this is their story about how terrible the situation was in 2008. Remember, 2008 is our peak of wages. 2008 would be our Macmillan moment. 2008, Tony Blair, if he wasn't having to resign, <laughs> could have stood up and said, you've never had it so good, and it would have been true in 2008. Um, but we had huge numbers of children in low-income families, a million were never really taken out of poverty. Why am I bothered about this? This is a picture of the roundabout I grew up in from the age of six. It's coloured by the deprivation index. You can see why if you were a child from the age of six to 18 and you lived on that roundabout, you might be interested in social inequality. Right? There aren't many places where you have all the pies. Uh, this is a bit of James, but more of Ollie O'Brien, I think, or mainly Ollie O'Brien. Based on mathematic mapping, suddenly you take the faceless chore path maps, and simply by cutting out all the spaces between the streets, you make it human. It's a brilliant move. Um, and you get away with red and green being mixed as well. And, and nobody complains because the subject is interesting. So I'm going to show you a few more of these. Uh, if I had time, I would play you the video of the Hovis Avert. <laughs> Hovis Avert, 1973. 
Who was the director? <coughs> Ridley. Well done, Ridley Scott. Yeah, and it's uh, the idyllic advert. Boy cycles to take the bread to Mrs. Whoever in the early. Actually, if you listen to the advert, I'm sure she's called Mrs. Bigotty. <laughs> and, and, and it was just a subtle joke about bigots in the 1970s because it, you know, it wasn't all great. Uh, and it's an advert about child labour in a way. But anyway, it's hard. It's been voted Britain's favourite advert. Um, and I'm a child in 1973, around the roundabout. Uh, it wasn't filmed in the north of England, it was filmed on Gold Hill in uh, Wiltshire, which you can look at one of Ollie's maps of, and then you begin to discover that even between Salisbury and Yeovil, um, if you look very carefully, you'll see little pockets of deprivation in the villages and places where people can't get the oil, they can't afford it now, to put in their heaters in some of the villages. We zoom in. This is 2021 census data. It's a deprivation index. Blue's bad. That's the top of Gold Hill. That's the point at which the advert was showing you how wonderful it was to have bread with no wheat germ taken out in 1973. ONS have done incredible innovations uh, with their census mapping. I think it's really, really good. It is user friendly. School children can use it. You can produce, this is an ONS produced in 20 seconds map. You can click and say, show me change from the last census, which is the only thing that actually really matters. You can look, and this is what works best when I'm showing this in church halls. You can zoom in and see how many of your neighbours, what percentage of them, have two or three spare bedrooms mm -hmm. when you've just paid half a million pounds for a house that's too small for your family in Oxford. Um, the degree of nosiness uh, can be quite high. Um, <laughs> classic ones, in case you weren't aware, the, 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 again, these are Ollie's. And these are, this is Edinburgh, 2015. Poverty around the edge. Changes a bit from train spotting, not that much. Uh, but Edinburgh's got better. The pattern's still there. The degree of poverty, the degree of deaths um, has gone down. Uh, Glasgow, 2015, was the almost one of the worst places in Europe. Now, not so bad. Overall, the poorest fifth of people in the UK are now on average poorer than the poorest fifth in all of Eastern Europe. Right. So this is an achievement in Glasgow in a country which has really become peripheral European. There are only five Eastern European countries out of the EU28 that have a worse neonatal mortality rate than we do. We don't tell ourselves these things are we trying to come up with an excuse, but some things get better. If you had very good eyesight, this is a picture that Mary Shaw took with me standing behind her being a bouncer in the late 90s. There's sewage coming out of the pipes and there's a small child in the top window. Uh, they've been demolished. The tenements are now gone. Uh, but this is my point about cost of living crisis. I'm showing you older maps because 2015, if this is what your country is like before suddenly food prices go up by 18% in a year, you know, your poverty is concentrated. There are really real social divides. You try the hardest you can to live in one of the green areas until your children go to school there and not to in one of the red areas. When things get worse, when you're the second most unequal country in Europe apart from Bulgaria, it is bad news. Resolution Foundation data from earlier this year. Of all children who have a brother and sister, two or more siblings, 56% in England are now going hungry two or three times a month. That's the majority. They made a mistake of having two siblings. Uh, because you don't get child benefit for the first child. It's just, just, you know, it's a majority. And then things get more expensive and you've got the rent. Uh, here's London. And again, very uh, divided, again from 2015. And then this is these are comments from people just putting maps up on Twitter that they've made themselves. Uh, this is Sheffield. And of course, these cities were always divided. Uh, the comment here is inequality in the UK is like water must be to fish. So omnipresent, such a fixed part of our daily lives that most of us don't even notice it's here. And the reason this matters is that when prices go up, for well-off people, where I used to live in the hill in Sheffield, it means no skiing in winter, 
or a cheaper summer holiday, for people in below the hill, it means going hungry. And how do you map that? Should you map that? Do you need to map that? I mean, what these differences do matter. Uh, here's the telegraph, and um, we also think demonstrating immense stupidity. There's a map of uh, homes with two or three more bedrooms, empty bedrooms, which of course nobody says they're empty. You need those two empty bedrooms or three empty bedrooms because that person might come back or the family come at Christmas or whatever. London has more bedrooms than people who ever need to sleep in it. And the headline in the Telegraph is West London is more spacious and the dark colours are in the south. Right. Anyway, uh, but normal map, but at least sort of showing things. Uh, some more of this amateur map making with ONS data. Uh, but when the 2021 census came out, one question is, well, where is the most overcrowded part of the UK? And they found, I'll show you where it is in a minute, uh, with this tiny little sliver of an output area where the majority of people are living in housing with two fewer bedrooms than you need. And what, what need means is you do not want an 11-year-old child sleeping in the same room as an unrelated adult. Right, for very obvious reasons. That's you've got one bedroom too few. Um and it's there, the south of the river. But by looking at the colour differences, you can see there's a whole swathe nearer the river where people complain, oh the rent's unbelievable, I can't believe I'm having to pay it, but they've got the bedrooms that they need, they might be sharing, but they're sharing with somebody they ain't want to share it with. And then you have these pockets where the overcrowding is dire, but because we're very English and we don't talk about it, nobody says what they're doing. And that's what the mapping can, can reveal. The mapping that everybody can do. Other changes, this was some work done by City Geographics, which shows um, the gentrification wave, you know, through Shoreditch that you may know about. But what it also shows is the area is degentrifying. The blue, the things we considered being posh, becoming less posher by other measures. In a way, we're all taking a step down. You know, those of us who went skiing twice, we're only going skiing once. Those of us who went skiing once aren't skiing. Those of us who had the least holiday in the summer holiday, just having a summer holiday, 40% of the children have no summer holiday at all. Everybody steps down. Uh, very famous map of Manchester in condition of the working class by Engels. It's always these men, like Booth, who came up early this morning, uh, sons of ship owners or factory men who, who drew these maps of poverty, but we don't know who actually drew them. Uh, this is actually in an art gallery in the States, and you compare fortune for the first map of poverty in Manchester. 2021 census. Um, Manchester, central Manchester, has been socially cleansed. The poor have been pushed out, and it's the census which shows it. So in a way, sort of success, but... Not really. Leeds, Birmingham, Liverpool, the same. You go in in the very middle as a tarted up railway station and some nice new apartments and flats. So the geography's there, but other than producing maps from ONS, it's, there's not much showing it as yet. Almost at the end. About four or five. So think, think of a question about these. Um, and we react differently to things. This is a map of commuting times. Uh, and our, our commuting time was one of the worst, but the reaction was, oh, it's only five minutes more, what are you complaining about? Mm -hmm. Yeah, which is partly why we don't have decent cycle systems and better public uh, transport. It's for the US, interestingly, that we're getting more and more better maps, I think, of social issues in my view, which in hindsight might not be surprising because the US has been in trouble for much longer than the UK. You know, two million people in prison. What's it? Two million living rough on the streets. Life expectancy far lower. Um, this is a map of the, of the well-paid jobs where they're disappearing. The red area is losing them. Where they're rising. So you know, a country becoming more geographically divided. It being reflected in in voting and so on. Uh, and here's my favourite one, but you have to look very close. This is one of Ken's. Uh, and Ken's doppelganger. Well, I don't know. I don't know if Ken's ever seen a picture of Herman Chernoff. Uh, <laughs> uh, Herman Chernoff is the inventor of Chernoff faces, these little things. 
Uh, which if we're talking about how people are doing, then sunken faces are actually quite a good, all fat faces, uh, for showing things. You can have angry eyes, not so angry eyes. Uh, distance between your eyes and your forehead is a kind of giveaway for age. This is why men like me desperately try to keep the hair here. Um, and that's an inset of Ken's map uh, using them on the cartogram. Mr. Chernoff, it's worth Googling him. He's a very happy statistician. Uh, he's still alive, just over 100. Uh, but the nice thing about Mr. Chernoff is there are never several articles of him and his wife, she did sadly die, I think, at 98. Uh, but the longest-lived couple in the state in America. Um, so maybe being a statistician is, is good for you. And here's my last map. I'm oh, sorry yeah, I couldn't find more or more exciting ones. I do think it's a kind of hole in what we do. It's the most important thing as far as most of the people in the world who fill in surveys are concerned. We don't produce maps of it. I suspect this map... I suspect the data's made up. I'd love to know if it isn't. Mm -hmm. It was very popular. It's, it's where is the grass greener? Uh, where would you go? And, and many people ask, you know, do they really think Germany and Switzerland is that great in those places? Of course, the irony, the irony is us. You know, and as far as we, yeah, yeah. I know somebody I just met from there, yeah, yeah, you are, you are the place where the grass is greener. Um, and the comment on this, of course, was, well, that explains why they left the EU then. Yeah. if you didn't actually have any intention of going there in the first place. Uh, thank you ever so much for letting me shout at you. Uh, happy to answer any questions. Have any questions for Danny? Yeah. Thanks, Danny. I think one, one of the reflections that I've had um, like map, maps are being used more and more, but, but actually there seems to be a bit of a, a divide in, uh, you know, uh, almost a political divide in, how, in, 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 in their style and how they're produced and how they're, they're being used. So actually, the, the news website that uses the most maps is the Daily Mail. So every day, the Daily Mail runs an appalling looking map. That has some kind of headline, you know, where dog attacks are, where hospitals are collapsing, and where you know, all these sorts of things, you know, where your area is worse at this or that, and that tapping into the what you said, that the nosy neighbours thing, you know, you want to see what your neighbours are doing. Um, they're quick and dirty, and they look, you know, if they're a critique in this room, they are being you know, critiqued by partially, but they're seen by more people than any other map that day. I suspect they're in the head of our you contrast that with the likes of the financial times, which do a, I think, an amazing job for a lot of in these challenges. And they do it to very high standards, but of course they're not shouting about it in the same way. So mm. my point here really is, is, is it so much about the maps themselves, or actually the context of their use and the accompanying headlines that come with them? Yeah, then I, um, well, I think I get it's complicated. Well, the thing about the FT is they do, if they can use a graph, they'll use a graph rather than a map. That partly because partly maybe it makes sense, but they're trying not to go for the emotive side. Uh, and sometimes you just have to be emotive. You have to say, this is where you grew up, this is your place, uh, and, and do that. Um, but it'd have to go back in time. The thing I didn't do... Um, is look back at the 1930s. And by the mid-late 30s, we were getting a particular kind of graphic, including maps, black and white, Vienna School. Uh, rich man with money bags, very subtly done. Rich man with a very small nose with money bags, which if you know your politics, you can work out, because Wolfgang, who did them, was Jewish anyway. Um, but there was a particular kind of angry graphic, which included maps in the 30s, quite and a lot of black um, that was done. There's a famous graph of everybody takes a step a picture of everybody takes a step down and they each have a hat which gives you their social class and the man at the bottom is going to drown uh, but it took 10 years from the beginnings of austerity in the 20s to get to that uh, but maybe we will uh, the mail does clickbait 
Uh, but at its best, 1942, the man had a cartoon, Three Cheers for Beverage. Uh, and if any of you are in Oxford on the 20th of September, I'm in a church hall debating the future society with Peter Hitchin uh, of the Mail. So in an attempt <laughs> to, to get things back, you just think it's unlikely. Uh, but I, we, the US does a better job in its newspapers of using maps. They never stopped using them. Uh, uh, and they use them more to, to show social issues. We stopped using them, and, and then they're in the mail, but they're not elsewhere. I can't remember. Last time I can remember a decent map in The Guardian was 1993. <laughs> and it's a double-page spread. And the, you know, I knew you can tell my political bias, but the, the, the title was The Incredible Disappearing Tories. It was a map of London showing which boroughs the Conservatives had just lost in 1993 because housing prices had been falling for four years. And when housing prices fall, people don't who vote Conservative normally stay at home. Uh, but it was a motive. The title was a motive. The whole thing was designed to say, this has changed. The whole of London is going Labour in 1993, four years before that election. And that's the last Guardian social map I can remember, which is a long, long 30 years ago. Right, the SOC had been alive for half of its current time. Yeah. Well, me, mine's more of an observation, and I don't wish to offend anyone, but I notice with interest that east of the Dolomites and say the Oder, it's almost all wished for predominantly Germanic, with a few exceptions. One is um, Estonia, which has strong ethnic links with Finland, would prefer to live in Finland. The Finns, who were once a, a part of Sweden, would prefer to be back with Sweden. Denmark and Norway, which were united, wish to be part of Sweden. But Sweden wishes to be part of the UK. <laughs> Having said that... Norway. Sorry. <laughs> Yeah, the other thing which is, uh, to me, of the most interest is that Romania and Tuscany, they're quite happy where they are, out of all of Europe. Yeah, this is my, my last go because I'm on time. If anybody can find that this was real data. <laughs> <laughs> it's gold dust if it's real. I, I, but I'm, I couldn't find the source and I've got a terrible feeling um, it's made up. But it works because you kind of yeah. know... Yeah. You, know, you know, that's probably what people think. Um, Germany, by the way, because I have to give you a point, uh, Germany uh, spends, in terms of public services and so on, the same amount as Labour promised in the 2019 manifesto. The promise was to be Germany. So it's interesting that they all want to be Germany. Uh, but we don't necessarily want to be Germany when we look at what it actually means to be Germany. Thank you very much.